Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Growth Cream Podcast. On this episode, I have Timothy Hicks and we discuss creating internal validation, nurturing your children's creativity, finding your spark, the work you need to do before you get married, and what a good partner is according to him. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. All right, Smoothie Hicks, welcome to the Growth Cream Podcast. How are you doing, man? Doing well. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. By the way, Smoothie is in his car because that's the only place he can get. <laughs> he can get some quiet. It's the only so. quiet place I can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perks of being a dad, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's okay, though. So. Yeah. So how how's your Dino? Doing good. Yeah. Um. I, I actually, uh, my daughter's inside. She's studying and she's, uh, wasn't feeling good today. So she actually took the day off of school. And then mm-hmm. after I get done here, I'm going to go take her to, uh, take her to her grandma's so she can rest. And she's, she just wasn't feeling good. She had, a looks like a stomach bug a little bit. So she's, I, I wanted to give her some rest. She's resting inside. So I figured, Hey, I'll go to the car here and, <laughs> and in the middle of pouring rain and, and, uh, <laughs> And do this podcast because, you know, I got to got to have, you know, she's got to have some rest and there's really not a quiet place in a family house. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. You're being a good dad. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So do you mind telling us a bit about yourself? Yeah, um, I am uh, a 46 year old. Uh, I live in uh, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, we are uh, I've been uh, I'm a single father. Mm-hmm. of two kids i have a older uh, child uh she is uh, uh she's 15 uh and then i have a younger child she's uh, she's 12 uh so they have i've been a single father for about 6 years i've mm-hmm. uh, been divorced for about 6 years and um i run my own business a family business that uh, i've run for about 12 years now and uh i decided about oh it's been probably about 4 years ago 3 or 4 years ago to start uh, kind of documenting my life and show single fathers and men in general uh, my life and what I'm dealing with, and what I do every day, uh, the stresses of running your own business as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. the stresses of being a single father, uh, how to be a better single father um, or better dad in general. Uh, so that was one of the things that I was really trying to provide. And then also, you know, everything else that seems to happen uh, to men, uh, I- issues important to men, uh, who are going through the same things I am like dating yeah. and, um, different things like that. So finances, things that, uh, fitness, uh, yeah. was, a, was a big one. So yeah, those are the things that I really wanted to kind of get across and what better way to do that than to kind of <laughs> document my journey. So, yeah. uh, and just do it in, in, and just do it uh, real time so that everybody can yeah. see it. Yeah. So you spoke about the stresses from being a single dad. Do you mind telling us about what it is like being a single dad? Well, uh, the stresses of being a single father, obviously it's, you're doing it. I mean, I I have a great co-parent, right? That's one of the things I I like to, to talk about on my timeline is the fact that, um, one of the things that's very rare, uh, Mm -hmm. in divorce are people that get, get along. Right. Yeah. Um, and me, me and my, uh, co-parent, my ex, um, we get along very well and we basically meet challenges together mm-hmm. with our kids. Um, we, we had, we had some challenges mo- uh, very recently that we were dealing with, with our kids with some stress and anxiety about school starting up and things like that. And so it really helps a lot to have a good co-parent. So I'll kind of, I'll kind of put an asterisk next to it. It's a struggle for a single parent because I do have a very helpful co-parent. Yeah. Now I know there's a lot of men, a lot of men out there that don't have that, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but one of the struggles are, you know, I, I'm raising two teenage girls, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. as a man, I can't really I can't really relate to them a lot in terms of of what they're going through in terms of things that they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. But as a father, one of the things that has helped is I can show them as an example of what I want. Uh, you know, what I want a man in their life to be, right. I want to be a good example, Mm -hmm. but that's one of the struggles is trying to be that example, trying to do the work and show them that, uh, that I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a good dad and that I'm trying to, you know, look out for their best interests and be a good example. So that's Mm -hmm. one of the struggles. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of other struggles. There's 
the day-to-day stuff where you've got to balance work and school and, and activities. And are you going to get involved in their PTA? Um, you know, I, I get involved in their school a lot. So, and it's just, there's a lot of time constraints and a lot of time uh, commitments that you have to make as a, as a single father, just like anybody else, but you're kind of doing it by yourself, right? You're running a household by yourself. So, yeah. So you said you wanted to be an example, like to create an image that they have to see in a man and all of that. So would you mind telling us a bit about this image? What uh, are you trying to mirror? What example are you trying to show them in terms of the type of husband or the type of man they should attract or they should be attracted to? Right. Well, as a, a person, a man, uh, mm-hmm. essentially that's dedicated and and is proud of his convictions, one mm-hmm. who has basically killed off all the skeletons in his closet and basically just, you know, an- announces himself to the world as who he is and takes mm-hmm. ownership of that. Right. Um, one of the things that men, a lot of men do these days that they, they try to hide and cower and, and try to get away from their past and it affects them. Uh, so one of the things I had to do is I had a lot of mistakes in my past. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I had to do was I had to kind of, and this is kind of what my blog does, is it announces to the world that I'm a flawed human being and mm-hmm. I am fully aware of what I've done wrong. Uh, and I am accepting of the fact that I did it and I am moving forward and accepting my mistakes and learning from them. So I think a, a man that has solid convictions, uh, a man who isn't afraid to make mistakes and mm-hmm. call himself out on it. Uh, a man who essentially is um, he's strong he protects, he is there. His presence is, is constant. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things a lot of these kids don't get is they don't get a constant presence from their dad. That's a reason we're seeing a lot of the, the, the issues we see here in in the United States with father fatherlessness. It's a, it's it's an epidemic here. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, having just having presence of mind and having a, a man to just be there as a father to support no matter what, Mm-hmm. Uh, and they know that they've got that that rock solid foundation. So I think any man like that would be a, a good for them. Somebody who is, you know, accepting of who he is, accepting of his mistakes, his flaws, knowing that he's going to push forward. And then, of course, what's really important is setting an, an example and being a good human being, being a good man, being a strong man, being somebody who, you know, stands by, has boundaries, and has convictions and has uh, good uh good morals, you know, good and things like that, you know, things that he unapologetically stands for. And I think when your kids see that, that's something that, that they can, they feel it makes, it's almost like a warm blanket for them. They just, they feel safe. They feel protected. They feel supported. They feel heard. So that's one of the many things. Yeah. So speaking of, um, let's talk about your divorce right now. So there's, an article you wrote on your website, or I, th- I think it was a tweet you wrote, where you said that men, um, after a d- divorce, they try to, or men and women, basically, after div- they get divorced, they try to sleep with as many women as possible to get that validation and and all of that. So would you mind talking about that? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things I did when I was, after I got divorced, was when you're, when you're getting a divorce, whether you're a man or a woman, you're going mm-hmm. through a, a very difficult time in your life yeah. where you were, your confidence in yourself has been shaken mm-hmm. because the person that you committed to for your life and you are not, are not compatible or there's something wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So instantly that's going, to, that's going to diminish your self-confidence. It's going to diminish your self-esteem. Yeah. very low. And I was one of those people that had that issue. I, my self-esteem was not great going into my marriage and it certainly wasn't any better coming out of it. And so it, it cratered everything pretty much cratered. So in order for me to function, mm-hmm. uh, even though I was still, you know, owner of a business and doing everything I needed to do, my social life was a, was a, was a wreck. It was a mess. And so in order for me to validate and feel good about myself, I had to turn around and get that validation from people outside of, uh, outside of myself. Cause I could not generate any internal validation, any energy inside of me mm-hmm. to get that confidence up. And so I ended up having to do that and, and I dated around and, and this was even during the separation. And then mm-hmm. after the divorce, it was just, it was, 
it was just, you know, kind of buffeting from different people to get validation. And if I wasn't dating somebody, well, then, of course, my validation or my, my self-esteem cratered again. So it's just a vicious cycle because every time I'd get somebody, then something would happen or I'd get into a relationship almost. And then it would crater again because and a lot of people in those situations and divorce are looking for that validation. They they get divorced and they think, oh, it's going to be a new start. But then they turn around and do the same exact thing they were doing before yeah. they got married. And then during their divorce, they just consistently go and look for these unhealthy people to act to add into their life and then many of them get remarried to these unhealthy people mm -hmm. and then many of them get a second get a second divorce so in the six years that i've been divorced i've been in several short-term relationships uh nothing really long term but it's kind of been a godsend because it's allowed me to up my validation for myself my internal validation so that it's it's good but it's also i've got people who have been second and third married in those six years since they've mm -hmm. been since i've been divorced i've got people i know who've been in I've got two guys right now. Uh, one is getting in his sec. He's just finished his second divorce, and another guy's getting ready to get married again for the third time. So I don't, and nobody wants to really do that, but it's like that's there's no there's no real guidebook on how to on what to do uh, after you get divorced, and so people are just you know they're just clinging to validation, this external validation from people because it's all they know, right? Yeah. So yeah. So how do you create that internal validation? you spoke about yeah what you have to do uh to create to create that internal validation is you have to do things to improve yourself mm -hmm. so one of the first things i had to do for my internal validation mm -hmm. was i was a lifelong fat guy right so yeah. i was this i had always been buffeting between 280 and 310 <clears throat> at the time that I decided to get into shape, I was at 308 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I, and one of the things that you have to do to get internal validation is you have to have a purpose. You have to have a motive to get up in the morning and do things mm -hmm. and you have to, you know, have to abide by that. So I decided <clears throat> about three years ago that I was going to lose weight and I was not mm -hmm. going to be fat anymore. So one one thing I had to do, and this is this is documented in my journey, and I still document it to this day, is I decided to lose weight. So I hired a personal trainer, and um, essentially started to get working on my diet and get working on things. So what I'm doing in, in in terms of internal validation is I'm building up a foundation inside of me, building mm -hmm. up a structure inside of me that's going to be able to weather any external slings and arrows, and it's going to be it's going to not care about external validation. So as I was doing great things, as I was consistently doing these things every day to try to lose weight, 10 pounds comes off, 20, 30. Uh, and before I knew it, uh, in the middle of 2019, or actually it was early 2020, I was down to 200, I was down 250 pounds from 308. Mm -hmm. So I was down 58 pounds. And then it still wasn't enough for me. So I ended up, I kept going on my journey. And then uh, late in 2021, I hired another uh, trainer to get serious about it because I had gotten that weight down and I lost part of the weight, but I started to get really serious about it. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up losing another 30 pounds. So, and almost 40 now. And so from 308, I'm down to 219 now. So almost 90 pounds that I've lost over that three years. So when you accomplish things like that, uh, you basically tell yourself, look, there is nothing outside of this that mm -hmm. can do anything to my confidence, to anything. It can, it, mm -hmm. You are not shaken when you were doing that. And that goes for hobbies. That goes for if you want to do any kind of a hobby, if you want to do, you know, if you're good at something and you practice that craft and you enjoy it. All it does is it builds up that internal validation and it keeps that engine going. So one of the things I love to do is go to the gym. I enjoy it a lot. It is a it is a uh, vital part of my life. Mm -hmm. And so that right there just consistently and I and you're basically giving your body good things. You're basically doing good things for your body. You're giving your body, mind and spirit good things to grow on and you're eating healthy and you're doing all these things. You're eating healthy. You're 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 acting healthy. Your your mentality is healthy. And all mm -hmm. it does is it boosts that internal validation. Mm -hmm. So would you say um, your 
lack of internal validation affected your marriage? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it did. And I mean, that that's the thing. I when I got married, mm-hmm. uh, and my ex will probably tell you this too. If 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 I ever if I ever had her on or asked her, she would basically say the same thing: is that when we got married, we just did it because one, I I wanted a girlfriend. I was mm-hmm. looking for external validation, and I got one finally. And she was looking, she, her biological clock was ticking. She wanted to have kids. Mm -hmm. So, and other than that, we really didn't know who each other was. I mean, we did, but we, we, we just kind of ended up together. If you know how that is, it's kind of, it's almost kind of depressing because it's like, you know, yeah, we were excited to meet each other and whatnot, but we were not complete people. We were not healthy people when we went into this. And so it turned the marriage basically into a very, I mean, we were married 10 years. Mm-hmm. But it turned the marriage into a very kind of, I don't know, you can call it a, a almost like a sour mix of stuff that just did not work out because we just did not know who we were. Mm-hmm. And so after the marriage, when the divorce ended, this is one of the things that we talk about. It's like we were so we were so uh, different from each other when we were married. But then all of a sudden we get divorced and then we find each other, we find each other, we discover our, uh, what we, re- who we really are. Mm-hmm. And she's got a really great husband now. She's remarried and, and he's awesome. And I'm, my life is fantastic. So it's like sometimes, and I hate, I, I hate to say this, but sometimes divorce is a good thing. Sometimes people need divorce. Sometimes people just don't need to be together. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the case with our divorce. Yeah. Let's talk about your um, life before uh, getting married. Basically, you said you needed a girlfriend and uh, you were overweight. And <laughs> what was that like? It was rough. I mean, it, <laughs> it, honestly, it was like, uh, you know, I think a lot of men are like that right now. I think a lot, we see a lot of men who are struggling with defining their own terms in this world. And that was the way I was. I was basically the people pleasing guy who just did what the crowd wanted him to do or the people around him wanted him to do because that's what, that's what everybody did. Right. So like my mom and my sister and, and my, uh, my other sister, they, they were all kind of pushing me to get married and, and, uh, and they were all kind of, you know, pushing me in different directions and just like, okay, I'll go here and I'll go here. And, And so I just kind of did it because I thought that's what everybody else did. I thought that if I got married, I'd be happy. If I had kids, I'd be happy. If I had the house in the suburbs with, you know, the two cars and the playground and the swimming pool, we'd be happy, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, it it was about things. It wasn't about anything else. And so I think that really, it really hindered me a lot. And then I think during my divorce, my older sister, who has been a, a, a guiding light for me, um, you know, she basically said, you know, do what you want to do. You know, what do you want? And and they, and nobody had ever really asked me that question. And of course, I was in therapy as well. And nobody had ever asked me what I wanted. And I never answered that question. What what do I want? And that was one of the things I, I was I was being motivated by other people uh, telling me what to do. And if they didn't tell me what to do, then I was just kind of lost. I was kind of floating in the middle of a lake with no with no paddles. Mm-hmm. And that was what, that was the mindset I was, I was kind of fighting against, uh, before I got married, it was rough. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about, um, gr- uh, raising your kid, your daughter. So I, there's mm-hmm. a, there's a tweet you wrote about, um, trying to nurture your children's creativity and how all children have creative outlets and all, all of that. So for my listeners who are new parents, what is your take on helping them nurture their creativity? Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of parents, and this is something I've learned very, uh, very recently, a lot of parents have expectations of their kids, right? Mm -hmm. You want to see your child, uh, you want to see your child get into sports. You want to see your child do well in school. You want to see your child because that's the, that's the, the vision that we have of our kids. We want our kids to be as great, if not greater than us. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the old adage, the old adage that I've always heard my parents, my parents always said, we want, we want you to have a better life than we did. Right. Mm -hmm. So that expectation that parents give manifests itself into a parent's mind about what they feel defines success for their kids. 
Mm-hmm. So they, you are absolutely defining success for your child before you, before they're even able to enjoy success themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. So when you do that, there's a, there's almost like a paradox and you're, you're kind of bashing against your child's promise or what they're going to do versus what you have in mind for them. So one of the things that I used to do with my kids, I'm like, well, I want you to get in sports. I want you to do this, this, and this. So I would almost like make them go do things like, go do this. You'll enjoy it. Go do this. You'll enjoy it. And instead of making them do things, I was not paying attention to what they uh, were doing themselves. Right. I wasn't paying attention to what, what are their interests? What I was being selfish. I was being a selfish parent. And so I ended up just getting, taking my hands off and saying, okay, let's see where you go. It's like, if you're, if you're teaching your child how to drive a car, right. You're going to be in the driver's the passenger side. You're going to be terrified, but they have the wheel so they can do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And you have to trust, you have to trust that they know and, and, and your parenting trust in your parenting skills that they know what, to do and what they want to do. And so the minute that I let my hands off the wheel and I said, okay, you guys drive, let's see what happens. They did some amazing things. Like they're, they're very big. Both of them are very big into art. Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying, Oh, art, that's terrible. I don't want you to do art. I, you know, I get them sketchbooks and watercolors and, and clay and different things that they can do so that I can, watch them enjoy what they like to do as opposed to me. I'm not a good artist. I never have been. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you should, it's like you don't water a plant with vinegar, Mm -hmm. right? You water it with water and you, and you give it sunlight and you let it grow and it grows its own way. And that's how we have to do with our kids. You have to find your child's motivation. Every child has a motivation. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's up to the parent to allow them to talk about it and say, Hey, what's your motivation? What is it that you want? What is it that's, that's giving you, uh, that, that, that lights a spark inside of you. And that's what it's up. That's up. That's up to parents to figure out because we see a lot of parents say, I got my kid into this. I got my kid into this and the kid and the parent loves it and they enjoy it. But your child is like, I don't like it. I hate this. I hate, you know, I, you get a lot of that. I've actually talked to a lot of my friends, who, you know, I talk to them and they're like, oh, yeah, they love field hockey or they love uh, they love uh, soccer or football. Uh, they love playing. Uh, they love playing the violin or things like that. And then you talk to the kid and the kid's like, I hate this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. I'm doing it to make my parents happy. So that, that is a disconnect there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you spoke earlier about you just spoke about uh, finding their spark as children and on my Twitter account, Grief Clinic, I get, I feel like this is a problem that affects people in their 20s all over the world. Like, my audience are spanned across the world, basically. So mm-hmm. there's always this question that keeps coming out to the extent that I had to write an ebook about it. Um, yeah. On Stalk Yourself, basically. There's, everybody has this problem of feeling stuck and not knowing what their spark is, not knowing what the, their purpose is and all of that. So what is your take on that? How do you guide people to help them find their spark as adolescents, basically in their twenties and all? And, right. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think that's a great, that's great. And I think it's hard because a lot of people don't have it, right. They don't have, they don't have that spark. They just are going through the motions. Yeah. And I was like that too. Um, my spark in college, uh, when I was in my twenties was, uh, I wanted to run my own company yeah. and I didn't know how I was going to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So how did I find that spark? Well, one of the things I did, uh, and one of the things that I think a lot of people could do is they try new things or they, they go and they, they write down what they think they would like. Yeah. That's one thing I wanted to do with my kids is like, write down what you think you would like. Mm-hmm. And they really never did it. They were just like, ah, I kind of like this. And then they, they kind of would be like that. But then you watch what they are naturally kind of attracted to mm-hmm. what activities they are naturally attracted to. One of my, my daughter was at one point attracted to tennis. She mm-hmm. really liked tennis and she wanted to play it. And then we, we did it right before COVID and then COVID hit me had to shut down everything. But, she was really into tennis. She really liked it. So we, we saw that as parents and said, okay, well here you can go do tennis. And I think anybody in their twenties could do that too. It's just like, think about, really think about 
and take some time to yourself. I think a lot of people uh, in their twenties as well, they don't, they, they, everybody's so quick to want to get into a relationship or get married or things like that. And that's fine if you want to do that, but Mm -hmm. between the ages and, you know, in high school, even in middle school, elementary school to high school to college, I think we should be cultivating as people and kids should be cultivating and Mm -hmm. look for things that interest you find them and then find your spark. That is where your spark lies. And so I think a lot of these people who are career, you know, there's probably people right now in cubicles that are, that are miserable because they, they told themselves that the things they wanted to do uh, were not um, the things they wanted to do were not plausible. Right. When I, when I was, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a meteorologist. I wanted to study the weather. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I said, Oh, I'm not going to be able to do that because of the math. And I think I may have cost myself something there. Right. And I think a lot of people talk themselves out of it. because, like, Oh, the work's too hard. I don't want to do it. Uh, But if you truly want to discover what, out of that you have to take a chance and you have to be uh you have to get out of that comfort zone a little bit mm-hmm. I just, as you're speaking something just came to my mind about how we you know we spoke about internal validation earlier and all mm-hmm. and how if you don't have proper internal validation it's affect your marriage so now these people in cubicles who feel miserable about their career who didn't find your spark who they are more likely to end up in troublesome marriages. So um, one thing about before getting married is to find your spark, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's absolutely right. It, it all mm-hmm. connects together. You're absolutely right. So yeah. when you find that spark, you notice that the longest lasting marriages are the marriages where two people mm-hmm. are not, they don't complete each other. They are two complete people and they work together towards a goal. Yeah. So that is that is one thing that that has been vital for me in terms of if I'm going to ever find uh, somebody who wants to be part of my life, I have to have somebody that wants to be that's going in the same direction as me. We have the same goals. We have the same dreams. We have the same um, we have all the same things. And it's not as difficult to find as you might think it would be. But yeah, exactly. I mean, that's basically they, they have a spark for life just like you do. And, you know, nobody wants to, nobody wants to marry a project, right? Nobody wants to marry somebody. It's like going into a house and it's not done. It's like, why would you want to live there if the house is not complete? Right. Or at least it's, you know, you, you have four walls and and, and nothing else, or you have, you don't have a roof on it. It's like, well, why would I want to live there if it's not going to protect me? Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to build, you don't want to have to take on another person's project and, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's going to have baggage, but Mm -hmm. Some you know you got somebody that's going on a on a weekend trip, or you got somebody that's going for three weeks somewhere. There's a lot of baggage there, so you got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, and I and I feel like the most common preparation people make before they get married is money. They um, scramble to get money in their twenties without really finding their spark, basically. So this now um, affects their marriage when they get married basically yeah and it just it it, it it's like a it, it just it snowballs and it just mm-hmm. rolls down the hill and any problems that you have going in are amplified because you did not do the important self-work i think a lot of people don't understand what it means to do self-work and what i did was i i call it monk mode and i think a lot of the, the guys in my my side of twitter call it that monk mode where you basically you don't you don't kind of, you don't isolate yourself. But what you do is, is you take some very important time, whether it be months or, or a couple of years or whatever. And you really do that internal work, yeah. find out what you want, who you are and uh, what, what your goals, dreams and, and mm-hmm. priorities are. And then you build that around that. And then as you do, you basically, you're basically building a planet and you're going to, you're going to bring things in to your orbit that are going to reflect your goals, values, morals, everything like that. And that's as a man, I think that's one of the most important things a man can do is to build his own gravitational pole and yeah. build a strong enough life that's going to pull people in that that are like minded. Yeah. And I, I think your know, monk one doesn't ever end because you are we are always as people, we are always improving and to improve, you need to go back and uh, like 
exclude yourself from the world or something, if that makes sense. Like, just stay away from, even when you're married, when you have kids, you still have to step back to actually build that gravitational force that you spoke about. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's important because being alone, and you have to, and the world will not let you be alone, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have to be able to push yourself away from the world, take some time to yourself, and continuously improve yourself. Um, that it, it, and it's not selfish. It's not yeah. one of the things I always say is, and is you can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah. My kids would not be where they are at, and and we obviously have struggles daily, and we always have, we obviously have triumphs daily. But my kids would not be where they're at. My family would not be where they're at if I gave them everything and gave myself nothing. Yeah. I would just be a husk. I would be a shell of who I was. And that's what I was doing before I was married. During my marriage, I was giving everybody everything of me. And I, at no point did I take the time and say, I need to do this for myself. I need to take care of me. I need to be strong and I need to take care of these things. And so I think a lot of men these days don't understand that, that concept. And so they basically will do whatever anybody else is telling them and they'll give of themselves without refilling that, that tank. So uh, if you could start all over again from before you got married to now that you're 46, what will you do differently? It's a really good question. Um, I would uh, I, I would take chances. I would take more chances. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not start really taking major chances in my life until I was about 40 to 42 years old. That was when and and I and I guess that's a good thing to kind of say as well because because you're never too old. They always say you're never too old to 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 start to do stuff. But if I had the chance again as a as a twenty something coming out, I would have. I had an opportunity when I was in in college to go to uh, South America for six months and and major in Spanish. And I wish I would have taken that opportunity. I wish I would have taken some of the opportunities to get out and see the world a little bit and get more traveled and get more wise to the ways of the world. Um, I think that is important for guys to do and you don't have to do it uh, a lot. You can, I mean, but what I would do is I would say, get out and explore your interests, get out and explore what you like to do and find new things, get out of your comfort zone. I think I lived in my comfort zone for about 20 years of my adult life. Mm-hmm. And while it was nice and it was warm and it was cozy all the time, it was, it, it held me back. And so if I were to do it all over again, I would basically just say to heck with it and to go and push through and get, do these things that I should have done a long time ago and get myself some experience out there in the world and live a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Timothy, it's I can't lie. This has been a really interesting podcast, and I'm thankful for, for you being here. And so, mm-hmm. thank where you. Can, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, if they can find me on several different places, but generally, my main my main hub is uh, unchartedfather.com, which is mm-hmm. my blog, yeah. and then of course I'm at Uncharted Father on Twitter and Uncharted Father on IG. So essentially, when you go to my blog, you'll kind of see my blog is my journal. Mm-hmm. It is, and there are some things on there, right? You know, people are like, "Well, are you just writing about the good things?" No, there's all sorts of bad things on there too. It just tells you about life in general and what I've had to deal with. From early on when I was just starting out after my divorce to to now. And so there's that's there's some great content there about what you guys, what people can can do in their life and, and my experiences of what I've been trying to fight through. And then of course Uncharted Father on Twitter. I uh, it's 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 a whole mixed bag of things. So you guys can follow me there. And then Uncharted Father on IG, you know, it's a little more intimate, shows you guys what what's going on in my family life and uh, what's happening right now with my life and everything else. So, and of course, uh, those are the three general areas you guys can hit if you guys need to get get in touch with me at all. All right, man, it's been really good talking to you. Uh, I really yes, enjoyed this episode. <laughs> yes, sir. I appreciate. It. Thank you. An honor to be on here, and and we appreciate it very much. All right, man. Thank you for coming to the show and have a nice day. Thank you. You too. Thank you for coming this far. I created the program for people feeling stuck, struggling with an addiction, trying to find your path, and want to become whole again. It is called the Self Master Program. Please check out the show notes to get a copy. 
and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.